Good morning. morning. Happy Sabbath. I see so many familiar faces. Um, I'm really glad that um, I get a chance to see friends that I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, Brother Dens and his wife knew me when I was um, little. Um, So uh, it's been a while. Uh, You know, every time that they see me, they call me Armandito because that means that, you know, they met me when I was little. And so it's always good to to see friends that, um, you know, traveling around the Texas conference, it's, it's, it's amazing you find some people that you have not seen in a long time. My, my name, as you can see, is Armando Miranda Jr. I'm the Associate Youth Director of the Texas conference, and I have no idea why I got there, but God knows. And um, I'm working with Pastor Gary. Did you meet Pastor Gary, I think, two weeks ago or last week? I got to tell you, it's kind of hard to keep up with that man. Even when you're listening to him speak and preach, he's all over the place, right? Meaning that he has a lot of energy. He's positive. He's always, always, always very positive, moving forward by the grace of God. So I get to work with him. It's, it's, it's a joy, actually. And um, I get to work with some of uh, the, uh, your members here. Uh, I got Cheryl, got Betty, and uh, a few others that work over there um, in, in the office. So it's, it's good to see them, even though I see them probably every, every week. But it's okay. It's a different, different setting. It's a church. It's a moment of worship. It's a moment of us getting to study the Word of God. And also I see some friends from summer camp. I saw Eddie and April back there. You know, Eddie and April did a great job at uh, summer camp. And if you haven't, if you haven't uh, supported anyone for summer camp, you have to. Lives are changed in one week. One moment in the lives of these young people, lives change. You cannot imagine the different testimonies that we got from families, from moms, from dads, who glorified the Lord for that week because it changed their teenagers, their young kids' lives. So good to see friends all over the place. Good to see friends, and especially Pastor Harley, as he uh, invited me to come over here. And uh, he he mentioned that we had a, a men's ministry Sabbath today. And I'm like, but, but I'm a youth pastor. But actually I say, you know what? No, it's not true. I'm a pastor first, and then the youth work comes after. So I can actually say that today I'm going to speak to the men here, even though, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a youth pastor. I actually pastor for, for nine years in, uh, in churches, so it's not hard for me to speak to, to, the, uh, to different topics. So I'm glad also to be joined by my wife, and my beautiful two boys that make my life uh, just go and uh, get me tired a little bit. And so, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I get to spend one more Sabbath with them. So today, um, let's open the Word of God. I think that more than anything on Sabbath, we should be opening the Word of God more and more. So I want to invite you to go uh, to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. And we're going to read from the beginning, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise. Go over the Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Let us pray. The Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much because we have your word. 
Because in your word we can find what we need for today. So as we open it, as we study it, as we meditate upon it, may your spirit be upon us, upon this church. All these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I got to say something about this text. Because every time I read Joshua, it brings up memories of Jericho all the time. You know, it's something about Joshua and Jericho. And, uh, and just the whole story behind it. But we tend to oversee before the battle of Jericho. And we tend to oversee what is happening in the life of Joshua, a man chosen to lead Israel. Can you imagine Joshua right after Moses? How can you top Moses? Those are big shoes to fill. Nobody can compare to Moses in the eyes of many people in the people of Israel, with the people of Israel. Moses who has been for years the sole you know, uh, leader of Israel. And suddenly we have this situation where he is gone. And we have Joshua. Yes, they know Joshua. Joshua has been a leader in, in its own right. But he's not Moses. I mean, Joshua is no Moses. Can you imagine for a moment, what does it mean when you have to fill some shoes that you could probably never fill? Has it happened to you that you get to a job and the person before you actually was the most efficient, the one that brought the most sales, the one that was very uh, knowledgeable of everything in the company, worked for years, knew the ins and outs of everything, and you get there and they expect you to do the same. Whoa. Can you imagine this man, Joshua, right before the sea, uh, the, the, the river of Jordan? Can you imagine his thoughts as he is right there and looking before the people of Israel? A man that is troubled, a man that has a great responsibility before him. A man that God has chosen. Can you actually go into his mind and can you see the questions? God, um, why me? <laughs> you know, of all people, of all, why me? Why not Caleb? You know, Caleb spoke before, Lord. He rose up. I just stood up with him. And he rose up and he said. And he was speaking loud and everybody listened to him. And I was standing with him, but he was the one that spoke the most. Why not Caleb? You know, sometimes I look at this story and I start wondering about not only me, but I start wondering about the men in the churches. Why? Because there's something about men in church do you know that 58% of members in the Seventh-day Adventist church are women? So we have 42% of men in church. And sometimes it's very hard for men to step up to do things in some churches. I'm not saying this church. I, I know that this church is blessed and praise the Lord. You have plenty of men that is, there is step up and, and to the leadership roles. But there are many churches that I have been to that the church basically has a lot of women in leadership positions because men simply don't step up. And I don't know what are the, the situations in their lives. I do not know if they're looking at the, situ uh, of the position and say, you know what, I'm no Moses. I cannot do that. I can't be like the leader before me. I'm not trained. I'm not ready. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm not experienced. I have never done it. Nobody has taught me. Hmm. And I can see the story of Joshua right here. 
with some questions in his mind, am I the right man for this job? Remember, today is Men's Ministry Sabbath, so if I emphasize a little bit about that, don't, don't, don't take it upon, uh, against me. I'm just, I'm just trying to look into the story. So, now we're talking about men. What makes men a man? You know, there are different things, different characteristics, and um, I want to share some with you that many of you will, you know, uh, be very connected to. I'm blessed to have two young men in my house. The Lord saw fit that we had boys. Somehow, we ache for a girl, and we dream for a girl, but God said, no, you will have two boys. So my wife has to deal with three boys at home. <laughs> It is tough for my wife, too much testosterone. You know, you know how that goes for those of you who have boys? It is not any dresses at all, not any Barbies, but Legos and cars and trains and everything is on the floor all together. It's not about how nice am, gonna, am I going to dress up for school or if I have my hair well done. It's about let's go. I want to go. It's not about if we're going to spend time You know, cuddling and yeah, so nice. But it's about let's go and take a ride on the bike. And it's a five fall, it doesn't matter. Let's get up and let's keep going. It's about energy. It's about jumping all over the place, having holes on your pants, getting up and don't worry about if it's dirty or not. Just keep going. Boys. And it becomes about all those things at home. And I got to tell you, my wife needs a break, needs some girl time. Because those three boys at home, we can cause a ruckus. We can actually leave stuff on the floor, and we don't care much about that. We're not that neat. That's what boys and sometimes men do. Not only that, there's something about practicality. Simple-mindedness in men. Have you noticed? You know, has it happened to you, for those of you who have husbands, and, and then you ask, you know, what color would you like? You know, I remember my wife, she, asking me, she was asking me about the, the color of our wedding. And I'm like, um, how much is it going to cost? <laughs> She said, no, no, what color? I'm like, I, whatever you like, how much is it going to cost? Even the cake, what, what, what cake would you like? Whatever you like, just tell me how much. <laughs> simple answers. Sometimes my wife and I know that most of you get frustrated at the simple answers. Or maybe when we come into the house, do you notice anything different? Uh, um, <laughs> you know that question is trouble. Many times I have gone into my house and my wife did something I didn't even notice. Now, a friend of hers comes in, oh, look, the curtains. I'm like, oh, right, that's true. Simple-mindedness, practicality, simple answers, especially when we're in conversations. So, how about this? Eh, it was okay. So, what do you think? Eh, So, um, uh, how are we going to do it? We'll figure it out. Have you had those answers before in a conversation with a man? Has it happened to you too that sometimes you get lost, but there's something about not asking for directions? You know, you will not ask. Uh, well, in my case, I won't until I'm lost, really, really lost. I always tell my wife, you know, I'm actually, you know, finding a new way to get to that place. <laughs> You know, I'll find my way somehow. I remember this gas station here, but it just happens that it's not the right one. Whoa, I got to go back until I say, okay, all right, let's go. Let's uh, follow the directions on the GPS or the map, whatever. Or let's stop at the gas station and ask for directions. Practicality. We don't complicate things. We want results. 
Most, of the, most men are like that. We want to get to the point B as fast as we can from point A. We don't want to see scenery. We want to get there. We don't want the best colors. We want to get there. We don't want, we just want simple answers. We don't want complicated things. There's something about Ben also that makes you different. Men, we don't care many things, many times about feelings, right? We don't care, and sometimes it's hard for, 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 for your wives, your friends, because men don't cry, right? We don't. We, we take it, and we say, something came into my eye, you know? <laughs> I'm okay, uh, I'm not crying, it's just, you know, something happened, but uh, I'm okay, I'm not crying. These feelings, we do not open up very easily. You know, conversations with my wife after 10 years, actually she has made some headway into my feelings. You know, you would think that after 10, yes, she has. Praise the Lord. We get great conversations. We talk about great things. But at the beginning, it was very tough because I was in such a way that I would not open at all. I said, okay, let me think about it. Come on, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. You see, but this is the thing about the difference between men and women. We're so different. When we come to church, there's men and women in church. So why is it that 58% of our church membership has more women? And why is it that men, even when they're here, do not step up to do certain things that God has called them to do and to be? Yes, we're simple-minded. We want results. We are closed in regards of our emotions. We are full of testosterone. We don't like too much drama. We just go for it. But then again, God has called us to do that in the church. To go and step up for God in the church. We sometimes say, well, I don't know if I should be able... I, I, I'm, able, I, I'm able to do that. God has defined a role for men and for women in the Bible. From the beginning, God in Genesis chapter 1 has given us some guidelines as to what men should be doing. First of all, God made men in his own image. He created men and women, both of them in his own image. We are reflectors of God, but when we come to church and we don't reflect God, we're not actually reflecting His image. We're not stepping up to what God made us to be. We like to just relax and enjoy. Well, you know, don't worry about it. It's church. We don't do that. You know, it's not manly enough. It's not exciting enough. And sometimes we forget that just because God made you, that's exciting. Because God made you in his own image and you have the responsibility to step up as God's own child in his own image. Also, God showed us that men should not be alone. They start to uh, decompose and stink and all these things. Actually, Genesis 2 says it. Yeah. God said it's not good for men to be alone. It's not good for men to be alone. So the reason that God said that is because he knows there was only men. There's not, it's not a good situation. Church is the same way. We have to have a balance. We have to have a place for both men and women. But God has told men to step up. You have to step up in church. In your life, in your spiritual life, you have to step up. You have to been made in my own image, says God. It's not good for you to be alone. You have to have fellowship with the people in your church, with women, with men in your church. You have to lead. 
You have to be what I made you to be. And you can find many other places in the Bible where men have been called to reflect or to be like God in regards of how they treat others, in regards of how their marriage should function. And I got to tell you, sometimes it scares me because being a father of two boys, I'm finding out that the responsibility of being a father of two boys is huge. Not that being a father to two girls is not huge. I'm just saying from my perspective right now. Because my responsibility is to teach those two boys to be men of God. And if I'm not stepping up in my life and what I do and what we do in church and how we respond to what's happening here, what's happening around our neighborhoods and reaching others, if I don't step up, then who's going to teach him? God has called me as a father to teach my sons to be men of God. And if I don't do it, the devil surely will say, I'll take him. I will do whatever it takes if you don't want him. Sometimes I see churches that do not have any mentoring role from older men to the young men in the congregation. Sometimes it's, hey, I'm done. My duty is done. I had enough kids. I raised them. They're okay. I'm just going to sit over here and be okay with God. Well, God has called you not to just sit. He has called you to step up and to mentor those young men, those young kids in your congregation to be men of God. It takes a church. It takes a church to keep our young people in the church. It is not just the father, which is the main reason for the kids to stay at church, but it takes a church and everything that you do, more than anything, men, to teach young kids and young men how to be a Christian, how to really be a man of God. It is something that many of our churches, many of our men in our, in our churches have forgotten. But today, we go to the story of Joshua. Because there's a message here for men and for all of us too. So we go and we see here a man who is in the, on a cusp of something that he has never dreamed before that it could happen. Can you think for a moment? He has always thought that Moses is the one that's going to take them over Jordan. The man of God, Moses, is going to take this group of people into the, Jordan, into the promised land. But somehow, he is put into this situation now. And I can tell you, he's afraid. Why? Because God has to encourage him. He has to be encouraged by God, not only once, not only twice, but three times in verses 6 through 9. Listen to the words that God says to Joshua. Be strong and of good courage. Why would you tell someone to be strong and of good courage? Well, it's because Joshua at this point in his life is fearing what's coming next. I don't know, men, where you are in your life. I don't know if you're fearing your responsibility with your children. I don't know if you're fearing your responsibility before God as a man in your marriage. God tells you today, be strong and courageous. I do not know where you are right now in your life. But God says, be strong and courageous. Why? (laughs) Because you are scared. We don't like to admit that. You may be down and out and you hide it pretty well coming to church and say, you know what, everything is fine. You put your happy Sabbath face. You know that face that you come in in the car, you're all upset, you're all sad. 
you know, and then you get out of the car and you see someone over there, the deacon, the deaconess, and you put the smile. Say, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Everything okay? Oh, yes. Praise the Lord. And inside, you're burning up. You cannot take it anymore. You are fearful of what's coming next. God is telling you today, be strong and of good courage. Why? Because there's things coming up in your life that he has prepared you for, that he has called you for, that will require you to be strong and courageous. You see, the story here tells us that God has promised this land. He has promised this place for his people. And he has to remind Joshua of those promises. All this land from Lebanon as far as the river Euphrates, the great sea going down of the sun, shall be your territory. This is what God has given you as a promise. And he will do that. Do not be afraid. Be strong and courageous. For us today, yes, we have challenges. But God has promised in your life, God has promised for your life many great things. Maybe a great job is coming to you and, and you're, you're, you're fearful. You don't know what it's going to take or what's going to happen. But God says, do not be fearful. I have promised you and I will make it happen. Maybe a family and, you, and you're finally getting married and you're like, whoa, uh, hi, I don't know how it's going to happen, what is going to happen. I don't know my marriage, if it's going to turn out and says, God, I have promised a good marriage. If you are strong and courageous and follow my words. Listen to this. This is the other part that we need to take very careful consideration. Verse 7. Only be strong and be very courageous that you may what? Ah. You see, it takes courage to follow God. It takes courage to follow what he has given us in his word. Believe me, I know that you have lived it through. It takes courage to follow what God tells you to do. Because sometimes what God asks you to do is so out of nowhere. It is so out there that you're like, really God? Really? You want me to do that? Uh, I don't know, Lord. I, I, I am not prepared. Do you think you're the only one that hesitates when God asks him to do something? Even Moses. Remember when he was over there by the burning uh, bush. And God says, you got to go back to Egypt. Uh, uh, Lord, you should change your plan, Lord. Um, I, I, I'm not good speaking at speaking. You know, I... I, I, I um, you see, I'm already, I, I just can't do it, Lord. You know, why don't, why don't you send someone else? Hey, Moses, you're going. But Lord, you know, I can't do it. I, I, if I go there, who, 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 who am I going to tell them? Who's, who sent me? Moses, tell them that I sent you. And that is enough. Now think about it for a moment. How many times has God asked you to step up in your life, in your marriage, in your church, as a father, as a son? And you say, Lord, I'm actually not capable of doing anything that you're asking me. That responsibility you're giving me, you know, that's the reason we have the pastor. He's trained to preach. I, I, I don't need to do that. Bible studies, no, I, I'm not trained. T testimonies and, 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 and go out door to door and ask people for, for a decision. Lord, I, I'm not good. Why don't you send uh, uh, my brother here? He, 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 he seems like a, a very nice guy, trained, you know, experienced. I can't do that. But God is calling you. God is telling you be strong and courageous. And it takes faith to follow what God 
is asking you to do. So today, today, as we see Joshua's story, as we see Joshua's story, he's been reminded that God is with him. He tells, go cross the Jordan. I will be with you. Don't be afraid. I am with you. Be strong and courageous to follow the law. To do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left. That you may prosper wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate in it day and night. That you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. And this reminds me of Deuteronomy chapter 6. These same, same words were spoken to another leader before Joshua. Moses, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, receives the same, the same command. Chapter 6, verse 6 and up. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them to who? Your to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. A strong man of God needs to be strong in the word. I cannot stress it enough. God has called you to be the priest of your house. God has called you to be the one that is reminding your family of the words of God. Amen. When you rise up, when you walk, when you go, doesn't matter because you need to have those words within your heart. And that is what God is calling Joshua, Moses, you and me today. You, men of God, need to be strong and courageous to follow what God has commanded you. And that is to follow His words. Why? What for? It's not just to keep Him for yourself. Actually, you have a responsibility to teach Him to your children. To the ones that God has given you responsibility of. You need to step up and say, I'm going to take this seriously and I'm going to teach the Bible every day at home to my children. I'm going to tell them exactly how God wants them to behave. I'm going to tell them exactly what God expects of them, what the Lord requires of them. And I'm going to do that because that's what God is calling you for. It is time for us to leave the world. It is time for us to stop letting the TV educate our children. It is time for us as men and families of God to say, internet games away because there is a time in our home where we study the Bible and it has to be increasing more and more. Amen. We cannot leave the education of our children to the world because they're pretty good at educating in all the wrong stuff. The devil knows how to destroy and it's not open. He's very, very subtle. But God is calling us to be strong and courageous to follow what He has commanded us. We may be scared because we do not know what is going to come up next. But God says, I will be with you. Go forth. Wherever your foot treads upon, that will be yours. That is what God is telling you and me today men of God and he is just one step away from from coming back and we need to be strong and courageous even more these days actually there's a quote from Ellen G. White that I want to share with you and I know that you have seen it before you have heard it this is one of the first uh, quotes that I learned in high school when I was in in, in high school in, in Mexico one of the teachers put it up and it, make it made an impact in my life. Because it says, 
The greatest one of the world is one of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right thing, though the heavens fall. Men like Joshua. Men like Moses. Men like Jesus. Because in the end, that's who we should follow. And that's who we should aim to be. And it is very sad sometimes that the men in our churches, that the men in our family circles are not taking this call from God. They're not taking the responsibility. And sometimes I blame even myself too because I'm in the same, in the same situation as everybody. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. We all have troubles and temptations. But God is telling us something today. God is telling you and me to be strong and courageous, to follow what he has given us, to be a rule in our lives, in our families. Because when the word of God becomes the center of our lives, even though heavens fall, we will stay honest and true to God. Amen. Even though the heavens around us seem like they're going to bring a thunderstorm and lightning, we can be sure and rest assured that God is with us. And if he is with us, who can be against us? Amen. So this is the reason that one more time in verse 9, Joshua, chapter 1, verse 9, God says this for the third time. And it is not an, a, a, a suggestion. It is not a option for you. <laughs> you see, when God commands something, it's serious. Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not be terrified nor dismayed, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Have I not commanded you? Sometimes I get scared of being a father. Nobody gave me a manual on how to raise not one, but two boys. Because they're not the same. They're boys, but they're not the same. Nobody told me exactly where to go, page 559, on how to raise a six-year-old. Why? Because I had never done that before. And I'm living it right now. And every day it changes. And I'm scared because I see sometimes the same problems that I have in my life, they're picking up just by seeing what I do. And I pray to God and I say, God, help me to be a, a good example. Help me to be the right father to these children. Why? Because it is a scary responsibility. And every time I get all scared and discouraged, I can look at this and say, God, you have commandment, commanded me to be strong and courageous. I need to be the man of God that you have called me to be. I need to be the father that you have called me to be because if I don't do it, my kids will not know about you. My kids will not know how and who God is. They will not know how to behave according to biblical moral principles, not according to the world. If I don't step up in my family, if I don't if I don't become the man that God has called me to be according to biblical commands, my family's in trouble. And just as I fear many times like that, I know that the church needs men to step up. I know that the church needs men to take their place in the church, whatever God has called you to do, because that's what God has called you to do. And if he calls you, he will give you what you need to go through. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He will be with you wherever you go. But many times we fear. 
I look at this story of Joshua and I see a man who leaves that place in chapter one encouraged by the word of God. You see, the words of God have something for all of us. When you are fearful, when you have doubts about what God wants you to do, go to the word. When you think that there's no way that you will find a place in your church, go to the word. When you fear that you have no way of raising kids the way that you need to be raising them, go to the word. Because when you go to the word of God, you will receive what you need and you will leave encouraged. That is the command today, to not depart from the words of God. For men to rise up and take their place as God commanded them, to love their wives as Christ loved their church, that he was willing to die for his wife. I never understood that until I got married. And until I had kids. I never understood the love of God fully until that happened. As a man, it's very simple and very easy for me to get involved in my own things, selfishness. That's the reason God said it. it's not good for men to be alone. Because when you get married and you see what Ephesians chapter 5 says, yeah, we, we tend to look at the submission part for the wives, right? That's the, uh, uh, hey, a lot of people say, well, that's, that's what the Bible says. Well, you forget that the Bible says that you should love your wife as Christ loved his church. And you know what he did? Because he loved his church, he was willing to give his own life, sacrifice himself, Give his only begotten son. I could not imagine myself giving my son for someone that doesn't love me. Not even for someone who loves me. I cannot sacrifice my son for someone because my son is so precious to me. That's the kind of love that God has for you and me. That's the kind of love that men should have not only for their wives but for the church because that's the, the, that's the, the, the symbolism that it represents. The symbol that represents the church. It's amazing. We should give our lives for God's church. I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about for the truth, for what it represents, for what the message that we have. And men, we need to step up just as women. But men, right now today, I'm giving a call to you. Because just as I am being called to step up in my life, to preach and to reach and to be a father to my kids, a man of God. You are called to die for your church. You are called to love your church. You are called to preach the gospel of this church just as Christ did. So today, I want to share with you one video that symbolizes pair, uh, fathers. And I, I don't know if you can put a uh, plug in uh, the sound because it does have sound up there in, in the presentation, in the video. Um, so I want you to see the call, not only for dads, but I want you to put it in the, in the spiritual perspective. We need dads, we need fathers, we need men in this church to step up. So we're going to put the video this time. Dad, dad, hey dad. I want to be rich and good looking. I want to be rich and good looking. I'll need you to challenge me. I'll need you to challenge me. To be rich and good works. To be rich and good works. I'll be focused on building my career at all costs. I'll need you to show me how to put my family ahead of work. I'll seek my own comfort and joy. I'll seek my own comfort and joy. I'll need you to teach me to honor God. I'll need you to teach me to honor God with my time and resources. I'll want to avoid hard conversations. I want to avoid hard conversations. I'll need you to show me how to speak the truth of love and love. 
I'll find myself wanting to please the crowd. I'll find myself wanting to please the crowd. I'll need you to remind me that I should obey God. That I should obey God. I'll look for happiness in many different places. I'll need you to show me that joy is found in following Christ. I'll want to treat girls how the world tells me to. I'll need you to show me how to honor them with all my actions. I'll find myself stuck in bad habits. I'll need you to show me the way out. I'll need you to show me the way out. I'll need you, Dad. I'll need you, Dad. I need you, Dad. I need you, Dad. To point me toward Christ when no one else will. To point me to Christ when no one else will. You may not be a dad yet. It makes me tear up all the time. <laughs> you may not be a dad, but you have. A lot of people in this congregation, a lot of young kids, that you may be able to help. Maybe you are already past that time. Maybe you say, I don't want to deal with that anymore. <laughs> but God has called men to be men for a reason. God has called men to, to look at the biblical principles of what it requires to be a man of God for a reason. And he's calling all the men in Cleaver and SEA Church to step up, to be the man that this church needs, to be the father that, this, that your children need, to be the young men that the society needs. To be the experienced man. To mentor other men in this church. Because we need, just as we need women in our lives, we need men. Just as the church needs women, we need men Amen. to step up and take up the cross and follow Christ, whatever he leads. Even though we may be scared. But God has commanded you to be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified of what comes, nor be discouraged because the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. May God bless you as we continue working for him. Amen.